You're on the Bible Forum. I'm Warren Sprouse. I wanted to share a little testimony with you. I ran across this article on uh, propheticnews.com. Apparently there is a pastor of one of Wisconsin's largest churches who has recently resigned due to marital infidelities and addictions. Let your mind wander around those two concepts for a minute. A pastor got marital infidelity going for him and addictions. We don't know what the addictions are. It may be sex, but my guess is it's drugs or alcohol or something of that nature. And he had the good sense, I suppose, when he got caught, that's usually the way it works, to resign from his church. And he wrote out a statement. And part of that statement says, while I have been open with you about much of the journey, and he's talking about the fact that he allowed as how he was out here seeing this woman, there is one part that I have kept hidden. He calls it a journey. Remember, people have a, a way of giving these awful, hideous things different non-offensive names. It wasn't a journey. He pastored a place called Elmbrook Church. He's the former, now, senior pastor. He wrote the letter, and the letter was obtained by the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. It says, I have also been struggling with a serious addiction, which has led to many betrayals, including unfaithfulness to my wife. The thought that comes to mind is everybody needs an excuse. It wasn't that I am immoral, it's I have a serious addiction and it led to betrayals. Is that an addiction to drugs or to sex? We don't know. He says, words cannot fully describe how sorry I am for my sin. The gravity of all of this is not lost on me. I have lied to my wife, my counselor, the men in my life, the elders, the staff, and the church. And I am so very sorry. As I come to terms with this, I must make two difficult steps for myself, my wife, and my children. And here it comes. Webb says he will seek treatment for the next six weeks but will not return to leadership. However, his wife will remain on staff as a pastor and director of global partnerships. Now, according to the article, this Elmbrook Church appears to be reeling from the revelation. The elder council chairman wrote, We are working diligently on an interim plan in the absence of a senior pastor and will communicate a way forward as soon as possible. We understand this is unimaginable news. Not to me. It's a staggering loss. I would doubt it. And we share your sorrow and sense of betrayal. It would be easy to lose hope, but let's gather together as a family this weekend to find solace and anchor our souls in Jesus, the only one who is capable of calming the chaos. A church member was interviewed by CBS, and he says this pastor, he called him by name, is isn't the only one dealing with the shock. Infidelity is about the worst betrayal you could do to someone that you've pleaded, pledged a commitment to. It's upsetting to find out that our leader of this church failed to live up to those promises. So what happened? Well, a man, probably with a number of talents and abilities, 
was thrust into a leadership role before he was ready, clearly, before he was tested adequately, and before there were accountability systems in place. Personally, his wife was deeply engaged in another aspect of ministry, which created a specific need for them to find quality time together, to isolate family from ministry. And in the end, she did not see any of this coming. And members of the congregation are among the majority today who don't get it. And they unwittingly facilitated the charade. Did you hear what she said? It's upsetting to find out that our leader of the church failed to live up to those promises he made. What's wrong with that? Well, the pastor was not our leader of the church. He was the leader of our church. Subtle, but it explains a great deal. When a congregation does not accept ownership for the church, it falls to the pastor, who then becomes the church. He is the symbolic church, meaning that it's about him. It's about what he does, what he doesn't do. We sit in the church and we wait for him to come out and show us what he's going to do and say and how he's going to say it. But this man was not pastoring the church. He was performing a job. He was the chief executive of an organization, no doubt. And if he wasn't that, he was at least the star attraction. And clearly he was not qualified for the position of pastor. Now, you might think that's unfair, but think about it. To be a pastor in a Christian church, you must be a biblically charactered man. A biblically charactered man would not put himself in harm's way. He would not encourage these sorts of immoral ideas. He would not view himself so superior as to be above temptation. And he would take steps to make sure he is protected at all times. I spent 40 years in pastoral ministry. My personal experience is that my wife was keenly tuned in to the women who took my time, keenly tuned in to how I was responding to her and to our children. We worked as a team. We were not in separate jobs. If there were unaccounted for times when I was out of communication, we didn't have cell phones, internet, all the other stuff. If I was out and outside for a while, for an extended amount of time, number one, I told her where I would be. I told her with whom I would be spending this time. Number two, she would be acutely aware of how odd this arrangement was. It's different for me. I didn't do this. But if I told her I was going to meet with somebody, a woman, she would be aware that that's eccentric. It's not normal. There was at least one time she warned me about a woman, a young woman. And I remember to this day she said, watch out for her. She was a lady in our church, young woman. I didn't spend a lot of time with this woman. She did come for counseling a couple of times. My office was in my home. My wife was home wasn't a private, secret kind of a thing. And we were not alone together 
in that sense. And there were no overt indicators from this woman. There was no touching. There was no hugging. There was no joking around in kind of an informal way. We didn't do that. But my wife saw something in this woman that clearly I did not. Men, your wives are tuned in to other women. They know. And I just poo-pooed the whole thing. I couldn't. Come on. About six months later, this woman came to me and announced that she was pregnant. Not married just pregnant. That's the value of a godly marital relationship and of a team attitude in the ministry. When a man views his ministry as something that's a being, it's about him, he's in trouble. As a pastor, I have nothing to offer other than the Word of God. The Holy Spirit does the work, not me. When I cross that line, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble with God. I'm in trouble with my wife. And I could be in trouble with that other woman and her husband may be coming looking for me just because we spent too much time together. He didn't know what we were doing just because she told him that she gave me a hug and that I hugged her back. It's that simple. In these mega churches, these guys don't get it, and in part because there is very little accountability. They're at the top of the heap, and they're isolated from the congregation. Most people in large churches never see their pastor except for that 45 minutes on Sunday or Tuesday or Thursday or whenever they go to church. In a real church, which would be a lot smaller, as I've told you before, not over 300 people. No one man can handle more than that. In a smaller church, everybody knows everything. It's like a small community. And there's wisdom in that and protection. When you see the next time some guy coming along and he's having to give up his ministry because of interaction with some woman, not his wife, watch the, the, the trail. How did he get there? It's always the same. 